sensitive subject, but of course, it's something that's going to enlighten you. Today, we are talking about the unexpected delivery. Of course, as you all may know, here in Indianapolis, we have the March of Dimes coming up on May 9th. And if you want to be a part of that, make sure you go to their website and get the details on it. But for that reason... I have my lovely sister on the show who's going to talk a little bit about her experience as far as having a baby prematurely. As you all know, having a premature baby is something that is not something that everyone goes through. However, when a family deals with it, it's not something easy to deal with. So she's going to enlighten us a little bit as to how to deal with that situation because her experience is one of a kind. And so, April, welcome to the show. Good morning. Okay, so let's talk Um, a little bit about your experience. I mean, I know it's been quite some time now, but just talk about what it was like for you to have your baby prematurely. Well, what it was like for me to have my baby prematurely, it wasn't really, it was more so expected as far as what was going on with my situation. Mm -hmm. Um, The doctor had already knew what was going on with my body as far as my body making food that the baby is supposed to swallow. Mm. And my baby stopped swallowing it, and my body continued to make it. I was about 26 weeks when I delivered, but if you looked at me, you would think that I was every bit of any day now. Wow. It was more so, yeah, it was It was kind of scary. Mm. It scared me a little bit. I went to the doctor on a Wednesday, mm. and I, they told me this, and then I delivered on Friday. Wow. So um, did you know I, you was in true labor at the point at that time, or was it just something that did. didn't feel right? I, no, I woke up in full labor. I was having contractions every five minutes. Wow, wow. And so when you got to the doctor, what specifically did they do to try to stop it? Because I know they they encourage people to come in, but sometimes they're able to stop people from giving birth at that given moment. Did they do anything in yes. particular, or was it they couldn't do nothing? They most definitely tried to stop it, and if they stopped it, I was going to have to remain in the hospital on bed rest until I delivered. But I was too far dilated for it to stop. I was already dilated to sleep once I got to the hospital. So I was way too far into labor for them to try to stop it. So how long did you deal with the labor pains before you got to the hospital then? About an hour and a half. Really? Wow. Wow. Okay. And so when you got there, you said they tried to stop it. And then once they realized they couldn't stop it, what took place next? I mean, was it a vaginal delivery? Was it a C-section? I mean, what? talk us through the events. What happened? It was a vaginal delivery. They kind of just treated it as I was at full-time labor. They hooked me up to IV, took me into a room Mm -hmm. where you would have labor and delivery regularly. I sat there until I was fully dilated and ready to push. And then that was when they took me into it the other room Mm -hmm. and I started pushing. I was in labor for about 12 hours. So what were your emotions at the time? I was more, I was scared. I was really scared because my baby had a condition that they saw in my ultrasound. Mm -hmm. It was like a cyst that they saw in my ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And I was just more so scared about that, about what was going to happen with him. I didn't know if he was going to, you know, come out properly. I wasn't sure if it would have if he was going to be stillborn, I didn't know what was going to happen. So that was the most scariest thing that you just don't know. So with the cyst, I mean, what what could that have affected? I mean, you said they caught it on the ultrasound, but what risk did it pose? It affected his bowels. It was called small bowel atresia. Mm-hmm. And he couldn't, he wasn't able to digest like normal babies. And he also was born without the ability to suck, breathe, or swallow. So he was on intravenous feeding for eight months before he was even able to try to take a bottle. Oh, my. My goodness. So, the whole eight months, did he stay at the hospital? Yes. Okay. So the whole what... eight months. They took him from the hospital, and then once he started doing better, they took him to the St. Vincent Rehabilitation Center, mm-hmm. and he started to do better there. But he just kept catching infections, infection after infection after infection in his tubing because he had a, a central line where they could feed him and draw blood so they wouldn't have to constantly stick him mm-hmm. to keep drawing blood and try to make sure that everything was okay, but he just, he couldn't shake the infection. So with that being said, I lost him because he just couldn't shake the infection. Wow. So what was the family like at the time? I mean, what was your family environment like? Did did y'all st- kind of close? Was it chaotic? I mean, did y'all go visit baby all the time? What was it like? 
Oh, we went every day to see him. Every single day we went to see him. The only thing that was hard was that I couldn't stay with him at night. I always had to leave and go home. And we were able to go visit him every day. I stayed all day. Mm -hmm. I bathed him. It was just like it was normal. We just weren't at home. We were just at the hospital. So with that being the situation, does that mean the doctor bills kind of added up or does the state kind of step in at that time and help? The state. Uh, stepped in and helped. Um, I had a lot of family support. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of support from social workers and nurses. I had a lot of support from a lot of people. Wow. And, you know, you just, you never realize how, how, how many good people are still out there that's willing to help. Right. Right. Wow. And so what was, when you gave birth, let's talk a little bit about what it was like holding him your first time. Um, obviously, as I already know, this was not your first child. So what was that like experiencing that delivery versus your first delivery it was still actually uh it was i'm not gonna say it was a normal delivery because of course it was premature mm -hmm. but with all the fluid that i had built up it was the fluid made its own sack so i had to mm -hmm. push out that sack first so it was still yeah, less painful it sounds like it yeah wow okay yeah and so and i still delivered uh he was still almost four pounds. He was three pounds and sixteen and fourteen ounces. I'm sorry. Wow. He was um still born at a, a a healthy weight for. I'm not gonna say you know it's not like a, it's a healthy weight for a premature, but for a premature baby, mm -hmm. almost four pounds is fantastic. Yeah, I guess so. If you consider the fact that they require babies to be at least five pounds at birth at regular delivery, so right. he's only a pound right. away. So. When it comes to that, I know it usually takes a little bit of time for them to get to their actual birth weight that they need to be at. Um, how long did it take for him to get to his weight? That, to it that healthy point, the healthy weight, shall I to say? To a healthy weight, he, he was about four months old when he finally reached seven pounds. Okay. Okay. And is that when That's they were time. more likely to let him go home or... What did he still have to stay the whole time because he wasn't eating right? Yes, he still had to stay because he still hadn't developed the suck, breathe, and swallow mm. all at once. Mm. Okay. So once he developed that, that was when we started working on him coming home. I had to go in. I had to do a training. I had to learn how to work mm -hmm. the machines. I had to learn how to give him all medications properly. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was, it was it was a hard road. It was hard. So what was your interaction with the father at the time like? I mean, was was he really emotional? Because, you know, men tend to deal with things a little different than us women. You know, they they kind of... He couldn't take it. Really? Okay. He couldn't take it. He couldn't take it. He never... I think the whole time he was in the hospital, he probably only went to see him like maybe three times. Wow. He just couldn't take seeing him like that. Did he so even... He was, and I don't... I never understood why mm -hmm. myself either because it wasn't... He wasn't even hooked up to it. He had... He wasn't on a ventilator. Mm-hmm. He could breathe on his own just fine. Mm -hmm. He wasn't hooked up to a lot of things. He just had an IV and a central line. The IV was for feeding, mm -hmm. and the central line was basically just for so they wouldn't have to continue to, you know, stick him to try to draw blood for wow. anything. Wow. But he he was fine. I just I never understood why he wouldn't, you know, be supported in that matter. Well, but you know, because he was young also. Right, and like I said, you know, people deal with things differently. Like you know, there are people who don't go to funerals just because they can't handle it you know and so with right. that it might have been a situation he just knew he couldn't really handle but did he hold the baby what did he attempt because i know some men they're they're scared of holding babies even if they're born healthy but i mean did he even hold the baby or was it like one of those situations where he didn't feel comfortable holding the baby he held him one time okay okay one time I remember him holding him, and I know it was a while ago, but I remember <laughs> very vaguely that he held him one time. I had another another guy that I had started to deal with. He paid more attention to the baby than his father did. Wow. Wow. That's unfortunate. But So would you say, how long has it been at this point since your baby was born? 11 years. Okay. Would you say that even though he was here for a very short period of time, um, you still formed a strong bond just over that course of time? Yes, I do. I feel like we bonded <laughs> great. I mean, wow. when I would walk into a room, he would just light up when he saw me. Aww. smile and laughing. 
he was a very happy baby. Aww. So I did feel like we bonded. That's why it hurt so much when I lost him because I felt like we had really developed that bond. You know, some people like, I know for me, of course, on the outside looking in, it's like, man, you would think a mother would not grieve as much because they didn't have much time to bond or they didn't form a solid relationship over a course of years versus like some parents would do with their kids. And so it was kind of interesting seeing that stamp, seeing you from that standpoint, because of course I was young, <laughs> um, but it was just like, <laughs> man, dang, like I, I was sad, but it was like, Oh, it, it's it's not going to last for long. Like, you know, I, I'm thinking, you know, it's not going to hurt for that long because it was just a baby. Like you, the baby don't say anything. But of course, like I said, I'm naive and I'm young at this point. And so it was different for me to see that that was my first time experiencing a baby. And even seeing a baby in a casket, it was really painful. Um, yeah. But when it comes to that, that standpoint, like when people have to deal with the baby pass on what are some things that you would like to share with folks um some advice that you would like to share with people to know how to deal with parents that's are that are in that position well first first um your your child is your child once you become a mother i don't care if your child lives 24 hours you're going to feel that pain because that's your child mm. um it never really goes away mm-hmm. I, i'm i still grieve I really wow. do. I still grieve. It's still on my mind every day. You just learn to live with the fact that you lost a child. Mm-hmm. But that grief, it never goes away. I still find myself crying. Sometimes I talk about it, and I'll mm-hmm. start crying because it's still hard to talk about. Wow. Um, the only thing that really bothered me about the whole situation was people kept saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm mm-hmm. sorry. I was, And I just wanted to blow up because I really wanted to know, what does it mean to say, that you're sorry when you lose a person. Like, I find myself when I have friends that lose people in their mm-hmm. families or lose their, you know, lose cousins or have a death in the family. I find myself trying to figure out something to say mm-hmm. other than I'm sorry for your loss because I know when I lost my son, I didn't like that. Wow. wow. I didn't because it was just like, you know, I'm sorry. Well, what did you do? What are you sorry for? What exactly are you sorry for? I just wanted to know. Mm. Mm-hmm. But that was the only thing that bothered me. Other than that, I had lots of support mm-hmm. from, you know, even from you, your mom, <laughs> all of y'all, support came. I had support from everywhere, and that really, really, that helps a lot. Wow. It really does. As long as when you got that support and when you can just build love from when you lose someone that's close to you, mm-hmm. even if it was for a short period of time, when you have that support, that really helps a great deal. Wow. Was there ever a point where you felt like people were insensitive in any way? No. Not, not at all. Not doing the process the whole the whole time you was pregnant or mm-hmm. after you gave birth or nothing. Okay. Mm-mm, not at all. Just I would say from his father because I just felt like he wasn't there, like he should have mm-hmm. been as a father. You know, I had more support from another guy than I had from his father, and that that hurt. You know, mm-hmm. it shouldn't have been like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. I've heard people say and again this goes to back to people just being ignorant because you know sometimes we don't know but i've heard people actually say like if you give birth to a premature child at least it won't hurt and i know you said you still felt all of it it didn't make a difference oh, 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 <laughs> um, I, don't care you, I don't really care if you have a one pound baby you still gonna feel every single pain wow <laughs> one pound a few ounces you still feel every single pain nothing changes as far as labor the size of you can have a 10 pound baby and not feel anything mm. if you have an epidural but wow. see, i had i had natural natural vaginal mm-hmm. no epidural no demerol no nothing mm. it was just all natural it doesn't really matter <laughs> what the wow. size of your baby is, mm-hmm. those labor pains are still going to hurt. Wow. So and anybody see, that says anything different, they are being untruthful. <laughs> would, you, would you say it's a little less harder as far as to push? Like, you don't have to push as hard? Does that make a difference? Or is it still the same as mm-hmm. with that, too? Nope. When I had my daughter, the razor was 6 pounds, 5 ounces. He was 3 pounds, 14 ounces. I still pushed the same. It's still Everything still felt the same. Wow. That's crazy. <laughs> I mean, it's just like you would think with the baby being smaller, it'd come out easier. You wouldn't have to feel as much pain. I mean, that's like I said, it goes back to ignorance. But that's why I'm glad you're on the show to enlighten us about these things, because some people really just don't know. And so, yeah, it's it's still the same. I think I had more 
more pain with him than I had with a full-term baby. Wow. When I had my daughter. Now, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I would have never yeah, expected that. Yeah. <laughs> I would have never <laughs> expected that. So let's talk a little bit about the doctors that you dealt with. I mean, did they seem like they were all in? Did they seem like they were well knowledgeable? Or did, you know, you kind of felt like they ain't doing something right? Did you have that intuition at all? Never. I had I had two really good doctors. Okay. Um, they were great. They they instantly knew when something was wrong. I had mm-hmm. they um, I had they sent me in for ultrasounds once a week to keep a close eye mm-hmm. on what was going on with the baby. And then that was when they um after they found out what was really going on, that was when they deemed me high risk. Mm-hmm. And from that point on, they were they were great. I never had any issues. I actually looked for her mm-hmm. when I got pregnant with my last baby because mm-hmm. I wanted to go back to her as a doctor, but she had moved. Out of town. So, like, okay, let me ask you this. Once you gave birth with this, well, with your second child, because you just talked about how you had your last child, but before you had your most recent child, um, when you gave birth that time, did did you at all feel like, you kind of like at any point before you went into labor, did you kind of just feel like, you know, I don't think I'm going to make it all the way to the end of this pregnancy. I thought I would. Like when they told me that, you know, you could be, you're this, I, I measured at, uh, I measured at eight and a half months at six months. Get out of so when here. They told, me that I could possibly be they told me when I could possibly go into labor, they was like, you know, this can happen. Your body could be triggered in labor because you're measuring at eight and a half months. I still thought, yeah, okay, I'll be all right. What? I never expected to go in labor. I didn't. I should say I didn't expect to go in labor so soon because, mm-hmm. like I said, I went to the doctor on a Wednesday and on Friday, I was in labor. Dang! Wow! Wow! So you I said mean, the I, I never <laughs> you said what triggered the whole premature birth though was the fluid that he was swallowing. Yeah, it's the your body makes some. I'm not sure if it's the amniotic fluid. Like, I never really asked questions because, you know, I was young. I was mm-hmm. still young myself. Mm-hmm. So I never really asked a lot of questions about what type of fluid it is that the body makes that the baby is supposed to swallow. But mm-hmm. the thing was, my baby stopped swallowing it, and my body kept making it. Oh, okay, okay. So, I was huge. I was I was really big. It was <laughs> now, I also... Four months, you would have thought I was seven. I've also heard people say if you take hot baths or hot shower, that could kind of trigger you to go into labor. Have you heard anything about that, or do you know that to be true at all? Yes, it's very true. Okay. With my last baby, <laughs> I, when I started to feel, <laughs> I started to feel labor pains, and I thought that a hot bath would actually calm me down, and it made my pains worse. Wow! Now that you say that, just that just made me think when I had my water break on my last baby. <laughs> I was in the laboring tub. That's what triggered my water to break. I mean, my first child, my water never broke, but I was the second child. Yes, I was in the laboring tub and it broke in there. I'm sorry, fellas, if you're listening, this sound a little graphic to you. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, this is girl talk one on one. This is how we get down. OK, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, like now that you say that, I mean, it did ease up my labor pains. It made it a little bit more soothing for me. But of course, it made my labor speed up. So now I can kind of understand why that will play a role. That makes sense. <laughs> and the funny, and the funny thing is, when I called, I called the doctor mm-hmm. to you know tell them what I was experiencing. And being that my labor pains with my last child, they were still they were real sporadic. Like mm-hmm. I would have a contraction, like in fifteen minutes, mm-hmm. I would have another one, and then maybe thirty minutes later, I would have another one. So my mm-hmm. contractions were real sporadic. So they didn't want me to go to the hospital, mm-hmm. but she did suggest that I take a warm bath. Ah, and that's what I did. And wow. It actually made my labor pains worse, and that was when they started coming. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, like, I I can't imagine, like, <laughs> just being at home and having that happen. I probably would have freaked out, honestly. <laughs> I probably would have freaked out, like, because, man, I, I mean, I it promise. Was- it was so quick. With Markel, I did. With Markel, I did freak out because I was at home with him. See, you know, when the race, I was in Duke. Mm-hmm. So I never went into labor on my own with her. I, they made an appointment and they popped my water bag themselves. Wow. But with Markel, I actually, then I was like, man, is this a contraction? Because, you know, I've never, I didn't have that experience from home. Uh-huh. And then mm-hmm. I sat down on the toilet. Fellas, if you listen, it gets graphic. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, 
I sat on the toilet because I thought I had to have a bowel movement. Mm. And I was pushing. Oh, wow. I was Goodness. Mama came in the bathroom. She was all panicky and frantic. Like, no, 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 get off the toilet, get off the toilet. You in labor, you in labor. And that was when they rushed me to the hospital. So they took you or you y'all had the ambulance come get you? They took me. In okay, the okay. Man, that's, oh my, I can't imagine, like, <laughs> having to go through that. Oh my goodness. Okay, so let's let's get back down to the, the subject matter. You said he passed away at eight months. What was the net um, cause? I mean, of course, he was born prematurely, and eight months, I think, is a pretty nice length of time to live past birth, you know, or being yeah. born prematurely. So what was it? What caused it? It, it wasn't the it wasn't being born pre- premature that actually took him away. Um, it was what the condition he was born with, which when they first found out what it was, they called it short gut syndrome. Mm-hmm. He was two days old when he had his first surgery mm-hmm. to try to um, what's the word I'm looking for to try to like re reconnect all of his intestines. He was uh, born with half of his intestines. It was just dead. It uh-huh. was dead. There was no blood flow, no oxygen because of the cyst that blocked it. It blocked a lot of blood flow and a lot of oxygen. So he was born with a lot of dead intestines that they had to go in and take off and reconstruct it. They connected it to his stomach Mm -hmm. to get blood flow, to flow through it, to Mm -hmm. make it healthy. But um, he just kept getting yeast infections inside of his tubing, and they didn't want to keep going in and giving him surgery to keep changing the tubing. So they, what they started trying to do was just give him, giving him antibiotics to try to clear the infection up mm-hmm. and also clear it in the tubing. And it just wasn't working. So what ultimately took him from us was he just kept getting those, getting the infection. He couldn't shake the infection. Oh, wow. But it was not the prima, it was not him being born premature. That is not what, what okay. made him pass away at all. It was the condition that he was born with. So did that t- pay a role at all? I, I kind of expected it. Mm-hmm. I kind of expected it because they told me, that babies that are born with this and they don't live long and they don't know where this condition comes from. It's not hereditary. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come from either side of the family. It's just something, I think they said one in every, maybe 150 kids are born with it. Wow. And see, that was going to be my next question. You'll never have two kids. You'll never have two kids born with the same thing. Okay. Like when I got pregnant with my third baby, they Mm -hmm. they were worried about, you know, me being high risk since I did deliver premature before. But mm-hmm. they were not worried at all about him being born with small bowel attrition. So they when you said, they just, when you got pregnant the third time, did those memories of losing your second child haunt you? Like, what did yeah. you have a lot of what if questions? Yes, they did. Yep, I did. I did. I was I was just nervous that that it would happen again. You know, I didn't want to go through losing the baby again. I was I was real scared and nervous, and I was just like, "What? What if he's born with this, and then I have to go through this all over again?" So, how did you that deal with it? Thing. How did you get through that? Mm, to be honest with you, I really don't know. I just kind of roll with the punches. Okay, okay. Um, and I was prepared. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Well. So basically, you're saying it was nothing that you did to encourage or provoke the premature birth or it was nothing that could have been done really to prevent him from passing. Is that what I'm getting? Say when you are pregnant, stay away from people who smoke. Mm, okay. I think secondhand smoke play a big part in what my baby was born with. Wow. After his very first surgery, the pediatric surgeon did ask me, if I smoked or if I was around smoke a lot because mm. his intestine was black. Have you ever seen the commercial Goodness. where they show the intestine when they squeeze the stuff out? Uh-uh. That's how his intestine was. I mean, I've seen the black yep. lungs from smoke, but intestines? If you ever wow. see an intestine, that, that his pediatric surgeon told me that's what his intestine looked like. That was his very first question to me, if I was around people that smoked. Because you know I don't smoke. Wow. But I was around second hair smoke a lot. So mm-hmm. with my with my air, with my fire baby, I stay away. You have to go outside and smoke. I mean, if you smoke outside and then came in, I got away from you because it's still in your clothes. Yeah. I completely stayed away from smoke. And see, I'm so like that, that too. Is <laughs> I can get to. 
Yeah, um, that is some advice I can give to people that's pregnant. Do not be, don't be around smoke. Don't let people around you that smoke mm-hmm. stay away from it because it does play a big part in the health of you and your baby. Yes, I definitely believe that. And, I mean, that's probably one of the reasons why doctors advise, like, when you have people, even after the baby is born, when you have people that's around mm-hmm. that smoke, make sure they don't have the smoke on their clothes when they hold the child um, for that simple reason because yep. they probably know that baby inhales it and it's, I mean, it's not going to be anything nice. So that's a good point. Um, We only have a few more minutes left. Was there any other final words that you want to give or anything that you want to share in regards to your experience or just some advice you want to give to parents who might be going through what you went through? Just stay strong and, you know, deal with it the best way you can, you know, Oh, Nobody really knows what's gonna happen, you know what I'm saying? Just mm-hmm. just just keep your head up in the whole situation. That was all I could do for myself. And, you know, try to have people around you that's gonna be supportive. If you don't have people around you that's gonna be negative about the situation, that's only gonna stress you more. Right. So if you don't have supportive people around you, I would say just get around some people that's gonna be supportive about the whole situation. So that's really all you need to get through. Right. I definitely agree with you as far as all of that, because, I mean, that would help you to keep a positive perspective on things when you have positive people around you. I mean, sometimes Mm -hmm. that's all you need is someone positive around you that kind of reinforce your thinking, because it's bad enough. You probably already got enough negative thoughts going on. (laughs) And then for somebody to come along and just drag you down there all the more, it's like, I, I don't need that. Not right now. I'm, yep. you know, I'm trying to fight thoughts that I already have. So, to, <laughs> right, I'm dealing with it. Yep. Right. That's the best thing I can say. Wow. Well, April, we really, really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story with us. Um, again, for those of you who are interested, the March of Dimes Walk is coming up Saturday, May 9th um, and that's at ten o'clock. Registration is at nine o'clock. And it's going to be right here in Indianapolis, Indiana, White River State Park. And if you live anywhere else in the U.S., make sure you go to the website, marchofdimes.org, and you can find out where's your local chapter when they will be having their walk. Okay. Again, like I said, this is the love factor. My sister, April, I love you, girl. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Love you, too. And I appreciate you sharing your story. All right. Well, you all all make make sure you check. Uh, check us out next week same time same place is going down right here on the love factor i'm gary signing off hey we're on the beach